Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Amen. Can we start out by giving the Lord a hand clap of praise? You know how we do. <laughs> This is a day that we have never seen, a day that we will never see again. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I don't know about you, but I'm just glad that the Lord uh, felt uh, it not robbery to wake us up this morning and to clothe us in our right minds. Um, it's, it's been a very trying week. There's been a lot going on in the city, uh, but God always shows himself uh, to still be on the throne. I always tell people that no matter what goes on in this earth, God's posture on the throne never changes. Uh, I encourage you all to try to learn about the sovereignty of God. Because when you learn that God is sovereign and that he is in total control of everything that transpires in heaven and earth, then uh, you know that you will have the victory. Uh, so continue to trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him. And the Bible says that God will direct your path. We pray for all those families in our city who's going through uh, bereavement. There has been tragic loss in our city, young people uh, taking each other's lives. There's just been a whole lot going on. Um, it's time for us as a church to really turn to God and to pray and to petition the throne of grace uh, because there will be no changes made in this earth if God is not sought after. If we don't chase him, if we don't petition the throne of grace, if we don't pray the way we should pray, because the Bible says where two or three touch and agree, it don't even really take many. If a few of us will be sincere and pray how we ought to pray, then some changes can be made. I trust God, even in moments where I can't trace him. And so um, we're gonna go to the Lord in prayer and then we're gonna dive into the word of God and see what the Lord has to say. Uh, anytime he calls a meeting, I used to hear the old preacher say, anytime God calls a meeting, he has something to say. And so I believe that God does use me as a vessel to speak to us where we are, and we serve a God who meets us where we are. And that's what I love about God. He meets us exactly where we need to be met. So let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning, first and foremost, to say thank you. Thank you for just being God all by yourself. If it had not been for the Lord on our side, Lord, we don't know where we would be today, but we thank you that you saw fit for us to be here and we're not here by accident or coincidence. We're here today by your divine providence. You orchestrated this, you called this meeting, and we pray that you would speak words of affirmation, confirmation, words of transformation to us today. We thank you for being the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. You are the one who was, the one who is, and the one who is to come. And so we rest in the bosom of the Lord this morning, knowing that you're going to take care of us. You have never left us. You've never left our side. We thank you for being faithful and remaining faithful, even when we have not been. And so, Lord, we love you today because you first loved us. We thank you that the service today, the word is not about any shape, form, or fashion. It's not about trying to con you out of anything because the Bible says you know our hearts. Before we ask you for anything, you already know what we need. We come, God, being transparent. We ask that you would strip us from the things that get in the way of you using us the way you want to use us. We pray that we will grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ every single day. And that we will never stop walking by faith and not by sight. Sometimes, God, you allow us to be tested in areas that we've never been tested in. And even through those tests, God, we still look to the hills from which comes our help, knowing that our help comes from the Lord. As the old saints used to say, nobody can do us like Jesus can. And so, God, we thank you for your presence. The Bible says that in the presence of the Lord is the fullness of joy. And so we thank you that we can have joy this morning, even in the midst of a struggle. We can smile today just because you are God all by yourself. So we ask that you would have your way today, that we would decrease and that you would increase. I pray that you remove those things from our mind 
that gets in the way of us hearing you and seeing what it is that you would have us to do. I pray, Lord, that you would just continue to teach us your ways. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. Have your way today through the word. And we'll magnify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Can we give God another hand? Clap? <laughs> Amen. I'm happy to be here. Um, I always counted the honor and the privilege to be able to stand before God and his people and proclaim his word. You have your Bibles with you. I want you to turn with me uh, to 2 Corinthians 5.17, and we'll just use this as our foundational verse. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Pray for Tab and Nita. They're on vacation. You know that if they wasn't out of town, you know where they would be, right? 2 Corinthians 5.17. Follow with me as I read this verse. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come, or all things have become new. And you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Uh, this morning, I want to speak from this simple uh, subject. And I think that we all can benefit from it. Uh, we want to talk about just shedding layers. Uh, shedding the old life, shedding layers, shedding our past, shedding the life that was never conducive to us becoming everything that God wants us to come. So we just want to shed some things this morning. We want to shed the old weight. And we want to walk into newness. We want to walk into newness. I want to experience the life that God designed me to live. And in order to walk into your newness, there are some things that may be lingering that we all need to shed. Shedding dead weight doesn't mean that you have something against people. It simply means that you need to focus on something that's going to push you into what God has called you to. Everybody at some point needs to take a thorough evaluation of where they are in life. And you need to ask God, are you where he wants you to be? Because people have a tendency to try to coach you into a life that they think is conducive for you. They try to coach you into what or where they think you should be. While they can be some great coaches, it doesn't mean that God assigned them to you. Okay? We have to always learn to hear the voice of God through all the plethora of voices that will speak in our ears and speak in our lives and people who want to prophesy over our lives and tell us what they see when it, it is so disconnected from what God has shown us. I'm not saying that God doesn't use people because God, use, God will use a donkey. God uses women, God uses men, God uses children. God uses every, anything that he see fits that's going to get the message to you. God will use it. But we have to be able to discern the voice of God over everything else that's speaking. If it doesn't align with what God is saying in his word and what God is saying in your heart, then you need to wait. I always tell people there are, there are three Answers to prayer. Yes, no, and wait. And whichever one God is speaking, in whichever season you're in, you need to be okay with it. Because one thing you cannot do, you can't manipulate God. If God says no, that's because it's because there's something on the other side 
that you ain't ready for. If God says halt, that means don't go. Be still. He had to tell the children of Israel that multiple times. When they were running from Pharaoh and the Red Sea was in front of them, they had nowhere to go. If they went forward, they all would drown in the sea. If they went backwards, then they would be killed by the soldiers of Pharaoh's army. So in that moment, God told them to be still and know that I am God. And so sometimes there's no need for you to do anything but be still. Amen. And sometimes we struggle with being still. We feel that we always have to help God out. Can I remind you this morning that God doesn't need your help? Can I just remind you of that? You need him. I need him. But listen, he can replace us. But you can't replace him. Y'all ain't hearing me. I said God can get a new you. I wish Adam would have learned that lesson. Come on. When he listened to Eve. He was under pressure. To conform to what she was telling him, not understanding that if you obey God, God will replace anything that's giving you bad advice. You have to always be willing to hear God. But in order to hear him effectively and efficiently, you have to learn how to shed some things. And the first thing you need to shed is your old way of thinking. Who, Lord have mercy. I need God to take our minds and to fashion it, to mold it, and to train it into what he wants us to think. Because all of us have a tendency to run off <laughs> mentally. Lord have mercy. The devil be playing mind games with children of God. I don't care how much you love God. The devil will pick a fight in your brain. He will have you thinking nobody loves you. He will have you thinking that you don't have any friends. Your family uh, doesn't love you. He'll have you thinking irrational thoughts. And we haven't learned how to really navigate through and separate what needs to be separated. We just run. The devil will make you run everything together. And I heard one writer say that no man... A woman is an island by themselves. And so if the enemy has you thinking that you can't trust anybody, then it makes you detach from the things and the people you need to attach to. Because if you look at the word, God, Paul needed uh, Barnabas. Barnabas needed Paul. Timothy needed Paul. People need people. God gave Adam a wife. She needed him. He needed her. You know, Lot needed Abram. Abram needed Lot. Well, not really. <laughs> because God did tell Abram, leave your family. Leave him too. And the Bible says, but Lot went with Abram. That's a prime example of learning how to shed Oh, wait. Sometimes people just go with you. You didn't invite them. They just come. If you go look at Genesis chapter 11, 12, and 13, Abram never told Lot to come with him. After God gave Abram the mandate, leave your father, leave your family, your father's house, house and leave this country, I'm going to show you where you need to go. Abraham said, Lord, where am I going? I'll show you as you get to moving. See, God is usually looking for obedience. And usually the obedience is in the go, not in the know. We feel that we have to know before we go. But if God says go, you need to just go in the direction that he's telling you. Y'all remember the ten lepers that Jesus healed and only one turned to say thank you? 
Don't you know that they were healed on their way to the priest? On their way to the church? On their way to being obedient? Because Jesus told them, go show yourself to the priest. Go to church first. And the Bible says, as they were going, they were healed. And so the, the obedience or the blessing is in going and not necessarily in knowing. If you go first, you'll learn later. Right? So we need to learn how to hear the voice of God and to learn to walk by faith and not by sight. There's a lot that you, you're not going to understand that God is going to tell you to do. Like, feed that person that's been dogging you out for years. Feed them. Go to their rescue. Help them out. I see some of y'all faces right now like, I ain't doing that. Whew, that's a struggle. But then... You have to go back and say, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And so if you can't do it, that's because you never asked God for the strength to do it. Hello, somebody. Because really, Lord, I really don't want to do it anyway. And if I don't want to do something, then I'm not going to really be praying that you give me the strength to do it. God says your biggest blessing comes in doing what you don't feel like doing. Yes. How many of you didn't feel like getting up going to church today? I didn't feel like getting up going to church, but I know God has a word for me. Yeah. He has a word for my right now. Yeah. For right where I am in my life, I need to hear God speak a rhema word to me. Yes. But you got to shed some weight. Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. I, I, I'm a new person. And when you start proclaiming that you're a new person, people are always trying to tap into the old you. How many of you have been tried this week? How many of you have been tried this month? This is a new month. How many of you have already been tried in October? They're trying to, they're trying to drag the old you out. They know you love the Lord and they know that you are intentionally trying to keep your life on the right path. But guess what? They don't care about that. They're trying to prove that you have not been transformed. Oh, Lord forbid if you curse somebody out. Oh, Lord. They're going to tell you you're going to hell. I knew you ain't never been saved. You don't love God the way you say you love him. But those be the same people picking the scab, picking, just picking the scab. Just keep, it's a test. It's a test. And you will never have a testimony if you don't learn how to pass tests. You can't call it a testimony unless you passed it. If you're still in it, it's still a test. It ain't a testimony until you, yeah, you look back and be like, oh yeah. If it had not been for the Lord on my side. Because I know what I was thinking in that moment. I, I know what I wanted to do. But God sent his sweet Holy Spirit to calm me down. Have anybody ever had the Holy Spirit to just blow on you? I'm getting ready to go off. I'm getting ready to lose it. I'm getting ready to take this thing to another level. But I hear the Holy Spirit, still small voice, just peace. I leave with you. Shalom. My peace I give you. In the midst of a storm, Jesus and his disciples are out there on the boat. The storm blows. The wind blows. It's getting crazy out there on the water. Jesus sleep. Ooh, I know some of you feel like Jesus sleeping on you. Like where you at, God? I'm in this storm. And I'm calling you. But your, your head is resting on the pillow. You're comfortable in this. I'm not. And then they begin to panic. They're shaking Jesus. Wake up, Jesus, lest we perish. 
He wake up, look around, shake his head, and say, haven't we already been through this before? This is just a replay. Same incident, same people, same elements that I control, and you're still panicking the same way. Jesus says, peace, be still. The winds and the waves both obey. And then guess what? He says, oh, you of little faith. Jesus fed the multitude of 5,000 plus women and children. But he told them, before I can feed you, you need to sit down in clusters of 50. And Jesus worked the miracle. He took the two fish and five barley loaves, fed the multitude, and then had to turn around and feed another crowd. And his same disciples, he had to teach them the lesson all over again. Because it was the disciples that said, Lord, how are we going to feed all these people? How, who going to feed them? He said, we are. You, you going to do it. Jesus looked up to heaven, took the two fish, five barley loaves, raised it up to the Father. And the Father multiplied what he had. Because he took what he had to work with and put it in the right hands. <laughs> Y'all. He said, take the little, lift it up to God, and say, I'm not complaining about how much it is. I'm just simply putting it in the hands of the one who specializes in multiplication. You will always have a surplus when you trust God. But when you start trusting your eyes, whew, and I know it's a struggle. I've been saying for years, you have to learn how to divorce your eyes. I'm divorcing you eyes today because you always get me in trouble. I'm always looking at the budget. I'm always looking at the bill. I'm always looking at this. And it's never enough with my natural eyes. It's never enough. But turn to your neighbor and say, it's more than enough. Oh, uh, y'all said it real weakly. <laughs> Tell them it's more than enough. Because what you're going to do moving forward is you're going to take what you have and you're going to go to God and say, this is what it is. I'm placing it in your hands and I'm trusting you with the results. I'm trusting you with the results, Lord, because I know that there is a surplus. You have already prepared blessings for us. You got blessings for us that we ain't even tapped into yet. And we'll never see where those blessings lie if we're always focused on what we don't have. And you got to get narrow-minded, simple-minded people out your life. Get, get out of my ear. Have you ever been around somebody who's complaining and you complain with them? <laughs> if you've done that before, say amen. amen. Oh, y'all said that real low. God heard you though. They complain, complain, complain. And in order for you to feel like you fit in, you got the other one complaint too. As good as God has been to you, I won't. I wish I would open up my mouth to complain against a God who's faithful every single day, who shows up every single day, who breathes into me the breath of life every single day, who's covering up ditches every single day. And I don't even deserve it, but he keeps on showing up. Lord have mercy. But you got you to gotta strip yourself. You got to strip yourself of dead weight. And this is what you want to ask God. Lord, I need you to strip me of dead weight. But I want to keep the good weight. 
I want you to strip me of everything because some weight is good for you. I just need you to peel off the weight that is dragging me through life. And sometimes that weight consists of people. And what's even more sad is that it can be people you love. Some of y'all always trying to save people who don't want to be saved. And it leaves you frustrated because you've invested all this time and all this money and all of your resources. And some of you have even opened up your homes to people who don't want to be saved. What are you supposed to do? Keep on doing it over and over and over and over again? No. You need to listen to God. God will tell you when enough is enough. And when God says enough is enough, it don't matter how they feel over there. I, God had to speak to me and remind me, Lena, that I can't be so busy doing and doing and doing for other people and letting my own self slip away. Because people don't care about your well-being as long as you take care of them. Am I making sense? As long as you're dishing out and as long as you're giving. And when you need something, they'll never call you and say, come see me. Come and see me. Let me do for you the way you've done for me. Let me break bread with you the way you broke bread with me. They will let you sink. But just know this. Peter was sinking too when he got out the boat. But you know what I admire about Peter? That he didn't allow his sinking to cause him to be prideful. Pride will make you sink. Try to have you drowning. You know what Peter said in front of those other 11, 11 disciples that stayed in that boat? Watching him drown and nobody jump off the boat to save him? How many of you ever read in the Bible where when, G, when Peter got out to walk on water and started sinking that one of the other disciples jumped in? That's their homeboy and they still didn't jump in. And guess what? All of them could swim and all of them were fishermen. And none of them later jumped in to save their boy. Y'all better be careful who you call friend. You better be careful who you let ride passenger seat and shotgun in your car. You better be careful who you let live in your vacant room feeling entitled like they deserve to be there just because you got it. I don't care if I got 5,000 square feet. It's mine. You got all those rooms over there. Why you don't let such and such live in your house? Because it's my house. You so selfish. No, I'm not. They ain't got nothing to be said. You, sometimes you have to make people level up. And if God don't tell you to save them, then you don't need to save them. Some people need to learn. That's the problem with everybody today. They do what they want to and don't do what they need. And then they expect you to put them where... You walking around feeling all guilty. You walking around feeling like you're not doing enough. And that you're responsible for their outcome when they... I got to strip that stuff. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says this. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, talking about the people who went before them, who are examples, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. 
and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. When I was looking at this verse, of course, understand this. Every weight is not a sin. Understand that. That's why the Bible draws a distinction here in the text. It says, lay aside every encumbrance, that's a weight, and every sin, that can also be a weight. But every encumbrance, sometimes you can do a good thing, but it can also become a weight. Sometimes you can do too much of a good thing for the wrong people. And it can become a weight to you. The writer of Hebrews says, you have to lay that aside. Didn't say it was going to fall off. Didn't say God was going to come down and kick it off. It didn't say God was going to do anything. The writer is telling you that it's your responsibility to lay the weight to the side. Meaning that if you let the weight drown you, weigh you down, it ain't nobody's fault but yours. You know how some people say, I got a monkey on my back? You just gonna let him stay on your back? <laughs> what you gonna do, walk around with a monkey on your back? Tell me about I got a monkey on my back? No, monkey on my back, he getting ready to get tossed off. Because I don't want that weight. One day I did an illustration at Brainerd Middle, Brainerd High School, speaking to the youth, and I took a book bag in there, and in that book bag, I put a lot of heavy rocks in it, the big boulder rocks, and I filled it to capacity with rocks. And I put it on the back of one of the young men the whole time I was talking to the youth, I put the, box, the, the bag on his back and I asked him to stand and hold it. He volunteered for it, so I was like, all right, come on. And the longer he stood there, his posture, his posture started changing. At first he was, yeah, he up, vibrant, strong, but I put that weight on his back and he started buckling at the knees, started sweating. Now he real quiet, his head down, he slumped over trying to hold it up as long as he could. I knew what was going to happen. That's why I needed a volunteer. That's what weight does to us. If you keep it on you long enough, at some point, gravity is going to win. And you know what the law of gravity says. Weight will bring you down. That's why you need to. Now, if, if, if all his friends sat around and watched him, nobody volunteered to help. Nobody, he didn't even look to see what was in the bag. I'm not going to put a bag on me full of stuff and I don't know what's in it. On every rock, I, I wrote drugs, I wrote alcohol, sex, I, I wrote all this stuff on the rock. So you got all this stuff in your bag weighing you down and not one time have you even taken the time to ask the person who put this monkey on your bag, what's in the bag? You got to strip yourself of dead weight. And the latter part of verse 2 says this. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. That means I'm running my own race. I can't run your race and my race. Because guess what? There's only one lane for me. Turn to your neighbor and say, stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. Woo! Yes, Lord. Stay in your lane, mind your business, and stop looking around while you're supposed to be running forward. Right, right. 
The finish line is way up here. Why are you worried about who's behind you? You need to be celebrating the fact that you that you got some folk behind you. You got to run your race. Don't let nobody trick you into thinking that you can run your race and theirs. And I'm going to tell you, most parents try to run their children's race. They, they've been grown since they were 14, 15 years old. And then they get 30 and 40 and want to be kids. Oh, huh. Lord have mercy. And now, now they, they want to be kids again, but you want to grow up and be grown so early on in your life. And now you want to wait till you get real, real grown. And now you want to be a child again. And some of y'all parents let them. I ain't letting y'all off the hook. Sometimes you let them. You raising their kids, cutting them. You no, know, that's their responsibility. And I know we all love our kids and grandkids. We love them to death. We love them dearly. I mean, you can't help but to love them. But guess what? It ain't always your responsibility. When I die, I want to die of old age in peace. Not because I had a stroke worried about something that I didn't bring into the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not because I had a stroke. Because my heart is so big for other people that I'm at my own help. And, and watch this. And when you go, they're going to cry over you. They're going to close that casket. That you, You're going to have an hour and a half, two hour funeral. And then guess what? They gonna listen. They gonna start turning up at the graveyard before they even put you in the ground. They gonna be toasting each other, planning what they gonna do next. They ain't gonna remember you long. The main ones that you helped ain't even gonna grieve in your absence. You gotta strip yourself. It doesn't have to be sin to be a weight. And another thing about a weight is that a weight takes away the distance and the endurance that you could go. I could go further if I get the weight off my back. I could go longer if I got the weight off my back. And sometimes, listen, it's just a matter of adjusting. Sometimes you have to adjust yourself and you have to realign yourself and you have to reposition yourself. Everybody need to be re repositioned at times. And listen, you will never be perfect. Can I remind y'all of that? You're going to make some mistakes along the way. But when you do, not if you do, I said when you do, make sure you don't let people make you think that you can't live on the other side of your mistake. There's a basketball player that I like, John ja Morant. He did some foolish stuff by flashing guns in the camera, knowing that kids follow him, and just it was just a bad thing to do, and he did it twice. And I was reading some comments yesterday where People were giving him a hard time because now he's working with kids and he's trying to do what's right. And now people won't give him grace to even do right. How are you going to stone me when I do wrong? And when I try to do right, you still stoning me. I don't understand how people who are recipients of grace have a hard time giving it. Don't ever make people cause you to feel that you can't rise, rise above the ashes. The man has to start somewhere. If he would have continued to be reckless, y'all was going to have him 
all in the news and all on social media dogging him. And when he does right, the same people who dog him for doing wrong is dogging him for doing right. And I said, it's crazy to me that y'all don't believe in grace. And then I started thinking, um, people believe in grace when they need it. Oh, everybody is a grace case when they need it. But some of the people you can't stand the most need grace the most. Ooh, Lord. And I know y'all can't stand some folks. It's some folk that you just don't like. But you need to remember, God showed me grace. I had the opportunity to speak at Tavares' funeral on Saturday, on, fr on Friday. And um, I was trying to remind the people that we need each other and we need God. You can't do nothing apart from him. Jesus said it. Go back and read John 15. Jesus says, I'm the vine. You are the branches. He that abides in me, I in him. All that. But then he also says that apart from me, you can do nothing. And you know what a whole bunch of folk are trying to do? They're trying to do everything without him. You think you don't need God? And I also told them, I said, I know a lot of y'all don't go to church. I said, but you're going to church one day. Oh, you come to church, baby. You can go voluntarily or involuntarily. You can walk in or get rolled in. But you're going. You're going to listen to somebody. Somebody is going to be speaking over you. Yeah, I don't like preachers. Well, one is going to preach your eulogy. We need a reality check. And I also remember telling them, and I feel that this was very important for them to know, is that you can always come back home. What a beautiful message. You can always come back back home. I think of the prodigal son wandering off into a far, far country. He got money in his pockets, friends. I'm talking about they turning up. Got all the nicest camels, horses, and buggies, chariots. I'm talking about they turning up. And money ain't a thing. Because guess what? I asked my dad for my inheritance and he ain't even dead yet. And the man was simply, when you ask your living father for your inheritance, you're telling your living dad that, man, I wish you was dead. Because you don't get an inheritance until the father dies. And then it's passed down to the next oldest child. And the oldest child said, I want my inheritance now. And the father granted him his wish. He gave him the money. He went out to a far, far country, turned up with all of his friends. And then guess what? When he got broke, he looked around and guess who was there? Nobody. Nobody is there. You know what? Most folk. Now, let me say it this way. You'll never know who really loves you till you have nothing. <sighs> till you need somebody. When you connect it to people, you'll know if they're going through something. You can't tell me that you don't. Now, if you're truly connected, <coughs> excuse me, if you're truly connected to anybody, at some point, they got to come see you. Or you got to go see them. And it's not what they say. It's what you see. If you got discernment and you know what you know 
and who you know. You know your people. Hey, how you doing? I, I, I'm doing good. No. What's wrong? Yeah. No, 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 no. You're going to tell me what's wrong today? Why? Because I know you. I know you well enough to know that you ain't telling me the full story. You're trying to do this by yourself when you don't have to. When you sow, you also reap. If you don't sow, ain't nothing to reap. But even though you don't sow, God shares grace Even when you know you ain't done what you're supposed to do, God still comes through clutch. He still comes through and does what he didn't have to do. Even for those of you who haven't done what you could do. <laughs> we just have to learn how to shed the layers. Now I'm going to give you one more point because I got, I got enough time for one more point. And I got three minutes. Hmm. Let me tell you this. A weight will sink you if you keep it on you too long. So the first thing you got to do is you got to ask God to strip you. Secondly, ask God to help you run your own race. I'm going to give you this verse. Proverbs 26, 17 says, interfering in someone else's argument is as foolish as yanking a dog's ears. Let me read that again. Interfering in someone else's argument is as foolish as yanking a dog ears. How many of you have ever pulled a dog ears? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Did you know that the most sensitive part of a dog is his ears? And it doesn't matter the breed of dog it is. If you yank their ears, do you know what they will do to you? They will do everything in their power to try to bite you. Okay? The Bible says that that's just foolish to even pull their ears. And so Solomon is saying when somebody else is having a quarrel or argument, it's as foolish for you to get in it as you yanking a dog's ears. So in essence, what Solomon is saying is mind your business. Mind your business. There will be times where you will have to help out, but you have to know when to hold them, fold them, and step back. Amen. Have you ever tried to help somebody? And you end up getting the worst end, yeah, of the situation, and you just showed up to help. Sometimes you gotta learn to stay in your house. Where you going? Nowhere. You wanna come over? Nope. <laughs> wanna hang out? Nah, I'm good today. Yeah. Oh. My mama told me a long time ago, and I, I'm still that way to this day. You don't always need to be in somebody's house. She was smart with it. Always be in somebody's house. Mama, can my friends come over? No, I don't like people all in the house. It was a select two or three or four that she let come over periodically. Just didn't want, you know, because it keeps up too much drama and trouble. And when you're trying to strip layers, Sometimes you got to have a season of isolation so you can get this stuff off of you so when you come out, you're light for the flight. Ask God to help you run your own race. And my last point is this. Ask God to help you put him first. Ask God to help you put him first. And I want to read these few verses before we close out. <clears throat> Revelation, without the S, 
It's only one revelation. The book of revelations. There's no revelations. There's only one revelation. <laughs> Chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. This is what it said. But I have this against you. This is what um, Jesus is saying to the church of Ephesus. He, he, first, he listed all the good things about him in the first couple of verses. And then... In verse 4, he says, but I do have a problem with you. I do want you to know that. He says that you have left your first love. You see that? You left your first love. He says, you left me. And isn't it It's crazy to think that a church can leave God? You left your first love. The church is built on the apostles. And Christ says, upon this rock will I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But the church has left God. He says, yeah, I got that against you. He addressed it. And then verse 5, he says, therefore, remember where you have fallen. And repent and do the deeds you did at first. Or else I am coming to you and I will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. God says, I'll remove the lights. And the lampstand also represents the pastors of the church. God said, I'll I start pulling my pastors from you. You got to, he says, I need you to remember where you've fallen from and get back to it. You got to get back to your first love. If there's anything in your life that you have put before God, you need to reconsider. Because the God that we serve is a jealous God. And he says, there, there's no other God before me. And so I don't know what you replace God with. God said, you need to, you need to address that idol because that's exactly what it is. It's an idol. You can't serve God and an idol. Deal with it or God will deal with you. The reason he addressed the church in Ephesus is because he wanted to give them an opportunity. It's called grace to fix what is broken. That's what I love about God. He's such an amazing God that he can know that you are living and dealing in brokenness. And he'll give you an opportunity to fix it. God always gives warning before destruction. And so whatever you're dealing with, just know that part of our struggle is us. And shedding the weight. Get the weight up off of you. So that you can be everything that God intended you to be. I want to run my race. I want to get to the finish line. And you know what I want to hear him say? Well done my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. You ain't did everything right. But you've been faithful over a few things. Come on up. That's what you want to hear. You want to hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen? Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. <laughs> we want to give you an opportunity. There may be someone here who does not know Christ as personal Lord and Savior. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death and the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Uh, the Bible also says that Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then the Bible also says that salvation is of the Lord. The Bible also says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised his son from the dead, you shall be saved. There is no excuse of anybody not having an opportunity to give their life to Christ. It's called drawing the net. When you go fishing, it's not enough to get the fish on the hook. You got to reel it in. You got to draw the net. You know, so, and God is still drawing people. The Bible says that no man comes to the Father except he draws them unto himself. God is in the business of drawing people. And however he has to get you in, he's going to get you. And I, I want to walk in. I want to hear his voice and hear him calling me. And I walk to him and say, Lord, here I am. I don't want to have to be dragged in because I can't walk. I don't want to have to come to God when I'm at a point that I can't be utilized. 
I want to come to him while I have health and strength and I can be used by him and I can be his feet, his hands, an extension of who he is. That's what we want. Amen. Amen. Well, let me pray and we're going to close out. Father, we thank you once again for your word. We thank you for all you've done. We thank you for all you're doing. We take this moment to lift up the Civils and Johnson family and all the other tragedies that has happened in our city. We pray for their families as well. We pray that you would restore family. We pray uh, that you would uh, draw our youth, get their attention, Lord. We pray that you would remove the hearts of stone and give your people a heart of flesh. I pray that the churches will understand that there is only one church, and that is the universal body of Christ. The Bible says that we are many members, but we are one body in Christ. Have your way, God. Be thee glorified. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, those of you who are going to give, uh, we're going to give you an opportunity to give. We have three different ways to give. The tab is watching. She's going to put a link in the comments where you can give online, or you can give uh, physically, or you can cash out Inner Peace Church. Or you can also text GIVE to 423-301-5545. However the Lord leads you to GIVE, that's between you and Him. We don't get in God's business. Uh, that's between you and God. I don't believe in twisting arms. I don't believe in breaking necks and doing all that stuff. If you're going to do it, you're going to do it anyway. And it won't be because me as the man of God has coerced you. I shouldn't have to do all that. It don't take all that. And so I pray as we leave this place that God will uh, bless each of you and whatever area you're struggling in. I pray that you keep your eyes open because the struggle is almost over. I believe that God does do divine interventions. That means that he steps into your mess and he turns it into a miracle and he can do it overnight. Yeah. And so that's what we're trusting God for. We're trusting him to step into this mess, turn it into a miracle. We pray for the pastor of this church. We pray for the members here. We pray that God will prosper them in all that they do. They've been a blessing to us to even open up the house of God to allow us to be here. And for that alone, we pray that God blesses them beyond measure. And so uh, we thank God for what he's doing, what he's done, and what he's going to do. Now may the grace of God and the sweet abiding communion of the Holy Spirit rest rule in the Bible with each of us now henceforth and forevermore. And the church said, Amen. 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 God bless you.